user. You want to be a school user. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. You want to you want to set up as a teacher as a teacher. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, real quick introduction. My name is Brad Fessler. I am the professional development and content manager here at Sphero. And just to give you a little bit of my background, uh, I spent 15 years in public education uh, teaching technology and engineering, uh, grades 9 through 12, and also uh, taught at Millersville University. So just kind of across the, the state line there, not far um, from where you guys are, uh, for four years in their engineering department. So. Uh, I was using Sphero products in the classroom long before I worked for Sphero. Um, so please feel free to ask questions as we go throughout this uh, session today. And uh, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, you know, the, the real answers of how they actually work in the classroom with students um, if you haven't used any of the, the Bolt robots yet. Um, we did mention a little bit uh, earlier to make sure you download the Sphero EDU app. And if you do have a, a robot, a Bolt in front of you and the app, we will do some hands-on things uh, throughout this session. You're actually gonna do some programming. If you don't have the robot in front of you, feel free to still do the programming part. Um, that way you have it saved and have it as a reference uh, later for you to use. I'm going to be jumping between a bunch of different cameras and slideshow, um, so bear with me as I transition between devices um, throughout our, our uh, session today. All right, so let's get started. So uh, just want to just give me a thumbs up. Is that right reading for everyone on the screen? Yep, perfect. All right. Thank you. So um, just real briefly. Uh, we're going to introduce Bolt, what it is, what it can do. Um, so Bolt is a spherical robot, right? It's approximately the size of a baseball, uh, a little over three inches um, in diameter. And it can be completely programmable, but it is also capable of just driving it around um, there. So there's lots of fun ways you can utilize Bolt. Um, both with the programming aspects and uh, being able to drive it from one spot to another um, through there. It is, it is waterproof. So there's all kinds of really cool water activities that you can do with this. Um, I, I love the water activities since I'm a tech and engineering teacher at heart here. I love being able to build things around Bolt and do all kinds of fun stuff that way um, with it. So feel free to take this thing and drop it in a sink or in the pool or whatever um, you might have access to that way. Um, do note that Bluetooth does not work underwater. So if you completely submerge this thing like, you know, a foot or two deep, it will disconnect from the app just because those kinds of signals do not travel through water. So just something to note, Bolt is buoyant. Um, meaning it will float with just like the top portion of it just above the surface of the water. So it will maintain a connection like that. Um, so some key features to Bolt are that LED matrix that's on the top. It's a bunch of LED lights that are um, in that grid pattern on there. And it allows us to do all kinds of cool animations. You can set it to certain colors. You can make it strobe and fade. And we'll, we'll explore some of those in a little while. Bolt also has the ability to communicate with other bolts. And it does that using infrared technology. So the way I uh, explain that is I'll have to say an older TV, right? Because new TVs, their remotes are now Bluetooth on a lot of them, but an older TV. So uh, when you press like the volume or channel button on an older TV, Right, you have to make sure that remote is kind of pointed towards that TV because it's sending light that we can't see in that infrared spectrum to that device to communicate. Bolts are capable of doing that as well. If you happen to have other robots um, that are made by Sphero there, 
like Rover, um, Rover and Bolt can actually communicate with each other in the exact same way. They all have those same sen set of uh, sensors in there. There's a bunch of other kinds of sensors in there. The big one being the IMU and that IMU uh, allows Bolt to know kind of where it is, um, how far it's moved and all kinds of other things. We'll explore some of those, uh, some of that data that's in there. You can also program Bolt in three different ways. You can program it in draw mode where you can just draw a path across the screen, set that speed, and Bolt will follow that path. Then you can block program, which is where about 90% of our users live in that block programming canvas. And that's where we'll uh, spend our time today is programming in that block programming canvas. But you do have the ability to also program using JavaScript. So if you want to dive into that text coding world with your students, you have that ability as well. Um, just some uh, things to keep in mind. It is Bluetooth, so there is a limited range. We say approximately a hundred foot range, um, depending on your device. The uh, thing to keep in mind here is Bluetooth devices are not all created equally. Um, so, you know, depending on the quality of the Bluetooth uh, chipset that's in your device, your programming device, whether it be Chromebook, iPad, whatever, um, you know, can affect that range as you go through there. It does charge via induction. So earlier we mentioned this little charging cradle that's there. And that charging cradle is what, oops, sorry, there you go. That little charging cradle is what charges the robot, right? And if you have a power pack, there's 15 of these things in the power pack. They are removable. There's a little black tab that you can press down on and this thing will pop out of there and you can just unplug the USB cable that's on the side and make that mobile for you. The one thing when you are charging the robot, please make sure that it's facing in the cradle the correct way. Um, they have a tendency while in uh, being transported in there to kind of flip onto their sides. They will not charge like that. So when you um, plug in the case, make sure that the LED matrix is facing up like you're seeing here on my camera, just to make sure that it is charging. When it is charging, that uh, cradle will have a blue LED that it blinks. And that blinking is indicating that it is charging. And when it turns solid blue, that means that bolt is fully charged. All right, so let's talk about block coding. So I'm gonna, again, jump between devices here. So I'm gonna jump over to my iPad for just a moment. So over here on my iPad, we are going to, um, one, connect to that robot in just a moment, and two, look at programs. So under the um, program tab that's on the side here, you'll see that you have your programs, it says my programs there, as well as Sphero programs. You may not have all these fun programs in here that I do, uh, it just depends if you've used that device um, for programming before or your account before. If you are not logged in, no big deal. I'll sign out so we can see what this looks like from a brand new, I just opened this um, kind of point of view here. So you can choose if you're a school or a home user. I would say you are a school user and you can either log in as a teacher or you can hit let's code. And this is like the quick start you're not logged in, your students actually don't ever really need to log in to Spiro EDU if you don't want them to. However, if you're gonna create a class and assign um, activities inside of Spiro EDU, then students will need to log in. And there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. You can sync with Google Classroom, you can sync with Clever, 
or you can use um, what we call class codes. And class codes are a quick and easy way to get your students in there. They don't have to remember a password or anything like that. Um, and I do believe there's a session later on today um, that will talk about you know, how to set up Spiro EDU and find those different things. So that is all uh, available for you in there. So let's look at the categories before we go ahead and get connected, just so we understand how this thing is organized. So at the bottom of this, the coding canvas, once we get into there, you'll see that there's a bunch of categories across the bottom. And these categories uh, start with movements, lights, and sounds. We're gonna deal with those three specifically in this session, as well as we'll take a look at just one of the blocks that's inside of the controls category. So the thing that I like to point out here about the coding categories, um, two things really, is one, there's a ton of blocks, okay? Don't feel that you need to know every single block that's in Sphero EDU, okay? That is 100% um, uh, not a realistic expectation for you or your students to know all of those blocks. As you can imagine, I use Sphero EDU uh, very frequently. There are blocks in Sphero EDU that I have never ever used in a program, okay? Um, just because there was never a need to use that particular block for something I was doing. So um, don't feel that you have to memorize all these things or that you need a cheat sheet of every single one of these commands out there. Um, you know, you can grow your knowledge as the students grow with it. Um, you know, that's what learning is all about, right? The other thing I like to point out is students, in their, um, just in their nature of being students, they love to find the most obscure way to solve a problem. So they'll find those blocks that you're like, I don't even know where you found that thing, right? Um, let alone how you're using it or why it's doing what it's doing. So here's what I like to uh, use as a helpful tool for, for you as the teacher to find out where those blocks are. If you look at the block when it's in the coding canvas, the color of that block will match the color of the category. So that is where you can find where the block actually lives in those categories. So everything is color coded for you in there. All right, so before we get connected, I want to talk about kind of the best practices here of connecting to robots. So there's two things um, that I want to bring up here is we have a new feature in here and that new feature is called find my robot. So you're seeing this happen in the animation here of connecting to a robot and we'll see an image that's displayed here, but I want to show you how to turn that on because it's not turned on by default. So if you're in Sphero EDU, you're in your app, up in that kind of top right corner is the little gear icon that's there. That's your settings menu. And if you click on that to go into there, the second uh, option down from the top is display find my robot. I highly recommend turning that on. I do believe in future releases of the app, this will be turned on by default. Um, I've been debating that with our software engineers and they told me data, everything is driven by data. So every time you guys go in there and turn that on and then connect to a robot, you're adding to my data um, to get the engineers to turn it on. So help me out. I appreciate that um, to do that, but it is super useful um, tool in there. The next one down, I'm just gonna mention this as well. Um, it says display text-to-speech controls. And what this is, this is a, a great accessibility option that's in there to help students that maybe have a little bit of that language barrier um, and being able to read 
some of the text that's in each step. And if you turn that on as well on the device, then Sphero EDU can actually read each of those steps to the student when they click the button to do that, which is really nice accessibility feature. So I leave those both turned on on my device. You can make your choice what works best for you. So to get ourselves connected, we like to use what we call the Harry Potter method. And we call it the Harry Potter method because you don't choose the robot, the robot chooses you. So if you have multiple robots in your room, you'll see exactly what I mean. I only have two robots turned on in my room just for simplicity's sake here. Um, but when you do this with a power pack, you're gonna have 15 robots um, powered on all at one shot. And it can get a little confusing, right? So we wanna help our students through this process. So the workflow for the Harry Potter method here is students line up that are going to connect to that, to that robot with their programming device in hand. And one at a time, they will click on the connect menu. They will choose the kind of robot, so Sphero Bolt. And they will see all the different robots that show up there. Looks like I only have one that's powered on at the moment. There we go, my other one. Now it woke up. All right. And I can pick either of those robots. I just happen to know which one I have on my desk. So I'm going to pick that one. It does not matter for the student. They would click on one of those robots and it will connect to that robot. So now you can see on my programming device, we have three dots that showed up here. And when I look at my actual robot, I have that same image show up on my robot. That is the advantage of find my robot. So the reason um, we do that this way is now the student can grab this robot, walk away, and then the next student starts the process. So then the next student clicks on the connection menu, they search for robots and um, go through the same process. It is super important that not every student searches for robots at the same time. The reason is, is it will find every robot that's available. And then once they uh, see that, students tend to just click on a robot well if that robot has already been connected to it's no longer available but it's still showing in their list and then you get connection issues right because you can't have two programming devices connect to the same robot at the same time so uh super important that they do this one at a time and once your students go through this process a few times this happens like kind of organically after that and happens very, very quickly. Meredith, it looks like you have a question. What's up? Okay, so I did bring our whole uh, suitcase home and it only identified one robot of the 15. Okay. So I'm not quite sure how I did charge them or at least I think I charged them, but some of them may not have charged because after hearing you talk about like turning them a certain way. Yep. Um, but I'm just wondering, how do you know if they're turned on or? Yeah, so going? great. So great question. So when you search, you'll see those um, show up. Also, if they're charged and powered on, when you remove it from the charging cradle, if there's power to that, when you remove it from there, you'll see it. It'll go through an animation on the top of it. So that's a great question. Um, so two things to note when you're charging inside of the power pack, um, make sure you plug the power pack in and the robots are oriented the correct direction. And on the front of the power pack, there's a little toggle switch. Make sure that switch is turned on. There's a little LED on the front that'll light up. And then look inside the case, you should see like this fireworks show of blue blinking, uh, LEDs in there um, of all of those robots starting to charge. If a particular cradle is not charging, double check to make sure that the robot's in there correctly and also double check to make sure that the USB cable is attached to um, the charging cradle correctly. 
because if you remove the cradles from there, um, you know, make sure that cable is still plugged in to it. There. So those are the common things to check when you're when you're working with the the power pack that way. Great question. Um, so with that, I'll I just want to jump back over here to the find my robot options. When we look at our programming device, we have a couple options that are here. We can close this or we can hit find with physical motion. And what that will do, you can probably hear that. The robot is spinning in a circle. And if I go back over here to my iPad and choose find with LEDs, it will take that um, and add a different image to it. And you can see here, I can look at uh, my robot. And again, I have a new image there. There's literally thousands of combinations of images and colors that go into this. Um, so the chances of students getting two uh, identical images and colors at the same time is like really, really small. That being said, on like week one of this feature being released, I was doing a virtual training and I had two teachers that got two images that were the same and I'll say of a very, very similar color. So they couldn't tell which one they were connected to. Um, so that's where the trick of hit that find with physical motion on one of them so you can see it move shows up. If that happens to you, I highly suggest go play the lottery that night because the chances of doing that are probably, uh, you know, uh, really, really, really tiny of uh, getting two images together like that. So just something to think about as you go through there. All right. So um, there's one last thing that we need to take a look at here, and it's aiming the robot. We're going to talk about heading here in just a moment, but it's important that we aim the robot so we know which way is zero degrees. And that'll make more sense here in just a moment, but I do want to show how we do that. So um, at this point, I am now ready to aim my uh, robot. There's a couple different ways I can do that inside of my program, or if I was going to drive my robot, I can hit the little drive icon and then hit aim. And when I hit aim, I get this menu here that allows me to drag this circle around um, to aim my robot. And what's happening is my robot is physically turning when I drag around that circle. And the blue light that's showing up here is the tail light of the robot, okay? So here's how I explain this to my students. I tell them to face the direction they want zero degrees to be, set the robot down on the floor in front of them, and point that blue light back at themselves. And that will set it up. As you saw there, um, if you have the most up-to-date app and firmware on your robots, you'll get these little arrows that are going through here and also helping the student to understand what direction zero degrees is going to be. So once you set zero degrees and let go, the robot will go back to its initial state and it is ready to be used. So that's how we aim the robot. So let's take a look at some programming concepts here. So the first one we're gonna look at is a roll block. So before we actually go down the road of uh, talking about the roll block, let's get into a program. So on your programming device, click on the programs menu that's there. If you get this little um, tutorial that pops up here, right? You can see um, right now it kind of like grayed out my screen and it's showing me like, hey, click on this. This is what we call the tutorial, right? When you're doing the tutorial, it like kind of like you're stuck with certain things. So in this case, if you have the tutorial popping up, I'm going to hit cancel because I don't want to be in the tutorial. And you don't want to be in the tutorial either in this situation because we're going to actually program 
and I'll tell you everything you need to know to get through this. So once I hit that cancel, then I can hit the plus button. You should get something that looks like this. There is, um, there is three things that we need to look at here. One, name your program. Super important that your students name their programs um, to make sure that they have them as a reference and that they know what it is. A uh, quick story about naming programs. We were at a trade show uh, a little over a year ago, and I logged in a bunch of our salespeople into my own Spiro EDU account because they wanted to, to use some of the programs that I had there for demonstrations. And then when I got back from the trade show and looked at my account, I literally had hundreds of untitled programs in my account. And I spent quite some time cleaning up my account after that. Students will end up with the same thing if you don't point this out to them. So I always make sure that um, I, you know, point out to my students, please name your program so that you know what it is. Super important. Then we got to choose the program type. In this case, we're going to choose blocks and we're going to choose the robot that we're going to use. I usually um, recommend only choosing the robot you're going to program with. And the reason is different robots have different blocks that are associated with just that robot because they have different features. So if you choose a different robot, you might be missing blocks or have blocks that don't work with that robot. So it's super important, pick the robot you're going to use. So in this case, we're, we're all working with Bolt. I'm gonna choose Bolt, I'm going to hit Create. And now I'm into that coding canvas that we saw the preview of earlier. I'm gonna just zoom in on mine so that it's hopefully a little bit bigger up there. And as Tracy pointed out, that aim is up there in the top right corner that allows us to aim the robot right here, just like we did earlier. And there's also a drive menu there. So if a student, you know, runs it underneath a countertop or um, up underneath some other things that are in the room and you can't like reach it, they can go in here and they can actually drive the robot and drive it back out of there. Another thing that's sometimes helpful is being able to change the color of the robot here, um, the color that's displayed by default on the robot. Sometimes that helps for students to identify what robot they have. But remember, you do have Find My Robot that you can go back to the connection menu and see what, what robot they're with there as well. So um, let's take a look at the roll block. So the roll block is the very first block under the movements category. And I'm just going to take that and drag it up there. And notice that I attached it to on start program. If you just drop a block out here on the coding canvas, just anywhere, Sphero EDU is going to ignore it, right? Because there's nothing to trigger it to occur. So I'm going to attach it to that on start program event block that's out there. Notice that you cannot get rid of the on start program event that is always going to be part of your canvas. You can choose to not put any blocks on there and do things with other events, but um, by default on start program will always be there. So let's take a look at these three parts to our on our to our roll block. So the roll block is made up of a heading and heading ranges from zero to 359 degrees. Okay. There's 360 degrees in that circle, right? So zero to 359 are our options and it is the direction that the robot will travel. Here's the thing that you need to know about heading. The heading is always the heading unless you tell it otherwise so what that means is it's persistent so i relate this to the compass for students so north is always north regardless of what direction i turn right so if i'm my ro if i'm the robot and 
this is zero degrees right now, but then I turn this way, zero degrees is still this way, even though I'm facing this way, right? So just remember that zero degrees is always zero degrees when you're working through that. The heading is persistent. Speed is how fast the robot will move. And speed ranges from zero to 255. And you're like, Brad, why would this not be um, zero to 100? Why would it not be a percentage? Well, zero to 255 is 256 unique um, possible speeds that are in there. And if we're thinking about programming, 256 is a significant number, right? And if you're unsure why 256 is a significant number, it's a great Google search at some point to make sure you go in and, and figure out why bits and bytes and 256 is important, right? The last parameter of our roll block is the duration. It's the amount of time that the robot is going to travel in that direction at that speed. So the next logical question that students have is, well, if I want to move one foot, what do I set this to? And your answer should be yes. And they're like, you didn't answer my question, right? Because your robot is going to be on different surfaces right so in my room i have like a tile floor like a like a slate tile floor in my room here it's a very smooth surface the robot will move very easily even at slow speeds if i was in a carpeted room i gotta turn that speed up a little more to get my robot moving at that it just takes more power to get it moving that way so there is no answer to if i set it at this speed and this time it's going to go this far on every single surface because it's always going to be different so a great exercise to get your students thinking about what are these numbers looking like in your room is put down markers on your floor like use painter's tape or something to to make marks that are specific distance and say all right experiment with what that speed and duration needs to be then once you get that i want you to go exactly twice as far and just make one change to your roll block well once they figure out the speed and duration if they want to go twice as far just multiply the duration by two and they're going to go twice as far, right? So it's a great little experiment to get the students thinking about how this works and doing some iterative uh, problem solving throughout this. So the distance it's going to travel is a function of the speed and the time, okay? All kinds of different surfaces can make that uh, those parameters change. So this is what all of those parameters look like, that heading, that speed, that time that's in there. Notice that you can enter decimals into the duration throughout there. And speed, I said before, goes zero to 255, but really it goes negative 255 to positive 255. It allows the robot to roll backwards as well. All right, and you can uh, toggle that little forward or backward that's in there to make it roll forward or backward. Meredith, go ahead. Um, quick question. So the zero degrees is where the blue light was facing us, correct? Zero degrees is the tail light, right? So it's actually the blue light is facing 180 degrees. Okay, so it'll roll away from the blue light. You got it. Yep. Okay. You got Thank it. Thank you. Yep. Nope. Perfect. That's a great question. It's a great question. So, what is the difference of setting a heading at 180 um, to make the robot roll back towards you or to set your speed at negative and leave the heading at zero? Well, 
if you have the heading set to 180, the robot's physically going to turn. So the robot's actually going to go and turn 180 degrees and come back towards you versus if you have the speed, the, ro the robot is just going to roll directly back towards you. Right. So those are the two differences. And sometimes students want to play around with that and figure those out um, on their own, which is a great little exercise in itself. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to add your roll block to your on start event, set a speed and duration, make sure you aim your robot and run your program so that you can see how this thing works. Um, experiment with different speeds and durations. We'll take like a minute or two here, and then I'm going to give you a challenge that goes with this. So set your heading, set your speed, and when you set a speed here, if you're like me, you like to be precise and not just like drag this slider up and down, tap on the number itself, and you can type in the number if you want and same thing with duration you can go in there and tap that number and set it up and don't forget you have the ability to enter decimals into there as well once you have that ready hit aim aim that robot to what is going to be zero degrees and then hit start and when you hit start, the robot is gonna start to roll. So if you have a bolt there and you're connected, go ahead and take a moment to just experiment with that. While you're all experimenting with that, I'm going to point out the data that's showing up on my screen here right now. It's showing location data measured in centimeters, and it's how far my robot moved. Now, you'll notice that mine still says it's moving ever so slightly. It's adding up. It's because I'm on a standing desk right now, and my robot is sitting on top of there. So every time I touch my desk, it makes that robot move a little more and it wobbles around and that's why it's it continues to go. If I hold on to the robot, it will stop doing that, right? And as I let go, you'll see it'll continue to add up a little bit. So this is location, so how far it moved. And if I swipe here, I can see the orientation of my robot. So I can see as I tilt it, right, pitch, roll and yaw and those are terms if you fly a lot those are terms that your pilots are using in the cockpit right so when they're taking off the plane pitches up right to take off and gain altitude when you're coming down the nose pitches down and it comes down for the landing when it's turning in the air it's going to roll left and right and you can see I'm getting this data to change by actually moving my robot. And then yaw, yaw is the scary one when you're coming in for a landing and you get that like crosswind and all of a sudden the plane's like kind of traveling a little sideways, right? Um, which does happen from time to time, right? And yaw is when that, that tail is not aligned with the nose in a straight line in the direction of travel, right? So it's how we turn. Then we also have all kinds of gyroscope data. So this is in um, degrees per second is your measurement here. And we're looking at all three of those axes. So you can see, I just picked up my robot and gave it a shake. So you can see how those numbers change throughout there. We also have the accelerometer. So me measured in uh, G force, right? So gravitational force. 
again in all three axes x y and z and then velocity so how fast it's moving on the x and y axes as well as the distance that the robot has moved in all of those axes right and all of that data is fed back to the programming device live right so we're seeing that in real time as it's coming back it makes this very very powerful as a as a scientific sensor as well um so i mentioned before i live in pennsylvania so i live just uh north of hershey pennsylvania so we had a uh, physics club at the high school that i taught at and we would do a physics day at hershey park so we would take our bolts write a program ahead of time and then physics students when they go to their go to the park for the physics day they would take a robot with them and their phone as their programming device they'd get on a ride they'd start the program and they'd put their uh phone and robot in like a zippered pocket in their pants or jacket or whatever and they'd ride the ride at the end of the ride they would stop the program and they would save the data so you can save this data up here and by clicking on that sensor data and you can download the csv file it's a spreadsheet of all of this data they would save that to their google drive and then uh, when everyone returned back to the classroom they would reverse engineer the ride based on the data that was there and try and figure out what ride at the park this data belonged to right so they would really um you could do some pretty cool things now that's high school students right so they're using this as a as a pretty advanced scientific sensor but pretty cool things that you can do with it that way all right so challenge time I want you to program a square and this is also a great challenge for your students to get them used to this so we're going to program a square here so we're going to need four roll blocks to do this i'm going to show you a shortcut here just to save some time of being able to duplicate something right so if you press and hold on the block you'll get the right click menu if you're on a laptop or a Chromebook of some sort that's not touchscreen, it would be right click on the block. And I'm going to choose duplicate. And what that does is it makes a copy of that block. I'm going to set it in place. I'm going to change my heading to 90 degrees. And then again, if I do this at the very top roll block and choose duplicate again, Notice it copies not only that block, but everything that's below it. So now I have four blocks and all I need to do is adjust my heading for those blocks because I want my speed and my time to be the same. So go ahead, make your adjustments. I'll switch back over to here so we see what we're, our challenge is. Note that your speed and times can be different than mine. What that will do is make your square larger or smaller. And once you have those four blocks in there and ready to go, go ahead and hit start and see what your square looks like. I'm going to run mine. All right. So, anyone have any observations? about the location data that's there. I mean, mine's not a perfect square because it's rolling on this little thing that's on top of there. And um, 
you know, so it's not going to be perfect that way. But take a look at the corners. Anyone have an observation there about those corners? They look slightly curved. Yeah, they look slightly curved. Yeah, perfect. All right. And this has to do with physics and how a computer reads code. So the way a computer reads code is it reads the first line of code and executes it. As soon as it's done executing it, it immediately reads the next line of code. So the individual parts of a roll block are heading, speed, time, and stop. So at the end of a roll block, the robot comes to a stop. The problem is we didn't allow for enough time for the robot to physically stop. So we need to account for that time. So what we want to do here is we want to add a delay between those so that the robot has enough time to physically stop before reading the next line of code. So we can find a delay under the controls menu. And I'm just going to take that delay and drag it up here for now. I'm all about shortcuts, just as your students will be. So once I set my delay time, I'm just going to set mine to one second. I'm going to duplicate these so that I have them so I don't have to type that in every time. And I'm now going to put that delay between each of my roll blocks. So go ahead and do that and rerun your program. Any idea why my location would look like a triangle when I watched it do a square? Oh, interesting. Did it run into something on the floor? No. Mm. It did. That's interesting. I mean, unless, unless it hit dirt, but I mean, I watched it make a square, but then on my thing, it's the location thing, it shows a triangle. I would say rerun it. Let's see what happens. Cause that's, okay. that, sounds, that sounds odd. <laughs> Brad, I'm going to jump in here real quick and remind you that um, our stop time for the session was 1120. I actually just heard Carrie tell somebody, she's like, I thought it ended at 1125 too, but apparently it's 1120. Um, oh, okay. So we are going to, we are going to wrap up, please, if we can. And by the way, everybody, I did put the attendance link in there. Make sure you're filling that out for each session. So you're going to want to get that for session number two, but I'll give Brad a little time to wrap things up. Yep. I appreciate that. Thank you. I have 1125 on my session time up here. So yeah, <laughs> perfect. Uh, so what you'll notice here is that my corners are now square that's in here. And when I do this particular activity with students, what I do after this point is add lights and sounds, right? Because everyone should have some style, right? So, so should your robot. So add those style things to there. Right. My style is pretty easy. Right. Put on a Sphero T-shirt. Right. And jump in front of the camera. Um, that that one's pretty easy for me. But uh, we want our students to be able to express that with the robot as well. The presentation um, should be in the drive. So you should have access to that. So there's a few more slides that we didn't get to that talk about lights and sounds. So feel free to reference that and work with this. And just as one last thing um, with this particular activity, if you look in Sphero EDU, this is a combination of blocks one and blocks two activities inside of Sphero EDU. So this is kind of mashing those two together. So hopefully you learned a little bit um, through this, uh, whether it was a new feature or how to work with uh, the robot itself throughout there. But if you do have any questions, just reach out, um, you know, to Tracy or anyone else uh, on the team and they can get you over to me, um, you know, to answer those kinds of questions and help you out. So uh, maybe we'll see, see you in other sessions later today. And if not, enjoy the rest of the conference today and uh, take care, everyone. Will the later session, because I was debating between it and another session, will it be like doing more than we did here or will it be a lot yeah. of repeat? 
Yeah, no, it will be it will be more than what we're doing. Uh, what we did here, it's going to be uh, lights, move or movement, light and sound, and okay. it's an activity. So you're actually going to do it's a, it's actually a language arts activity. Oh. It's less of me talking and more of you working in that particular session. Okay. So great, thank you. This was awesome. Yep, no problem. Thank you. And guys, I want to remind you that I'm a resource as well. Please invite me out to your school. I would be more than happy to come out to your school and work with you on learning all the ins and outs of your Bolt Power Pack, but I'm happy to come out and work with your teachers too. Um, some of your teachers will find that there are Sphero activities built into their curriculum as optional um, ways that the students can engage. So uh, they, they may come to you for support and just remember that I'm a resource for you as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and then um, as always if you guys need to linger for a few minutes and ask some individual questions please